following the good example of my son this morning, I will have only two things to say. <laughs> Took him 32 minutes to say it. It'll probably take me 64. <laughs> but I want to be light with you for about 10 minutes, and then I want to get heavy with you for about 10 minutes. And if I can follow my schedule in 20 minutes, I'll sit down. <laughs> Doesn't that make you feel good? Brother Gibbons said yes. Thank you. Thank you. Brother, brother, brother uh, Mike, I'm glad that he said what he did about you were the genius behind this program. And I commend you for putting this afternoon two young men back to back. I think that's, that's great. Aaron is not quite as smart as you are. He put me in with the older group. When I leave here, I'm going to see what church needs a youth minister. <laughs> and I'm going to apply. I can do that. I won't get hired. <laughs> Who knows what God has prepared for me. My testimony is that it's good to be a part of the family of God. You, in the last four years that I've been with you, are the family I never had. In the next 10 minutes, I will tell you about the family I never had. But let's get light for a while. Did you pass out those papers, boys? Let's hurry now. They're already supposed to have that in their hand. Come on, speed it up. In the meantime, I'll tell you my name. <laughs> it's in your bulletin. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. And I've been first all my life in the Ingram family, being the patriarch. And then with you good people here, my wife spoke last year. My son spoke this morning, and I'm the last. <laughs> so I don't mind being the last. <laughs> Doesn't hurt at all just so I get into heaven, whether I'm first or last won't make any difference. Now, the only reason why I'm passing these out, I, I, I want to say one thing though, if you're teaching or preaching, please don't use my outline. That's a no-no. <laughs> and, and the rest of you will do the same thing my son did when I gave it to him, he looked at it, he looked at me and he says, Dad, what's the matter with you? <laughs> I don't know, but I'm having fun. <laughs> uh, all right. I, Dave, are you back there? All right. I left and went back to get my necktie. And three or four people said, well, you don't need a necktie. I do. I got to have a necktie. So I asked them to take me back home to get my necktie. Number one there, my yin-yang. <laughs> Did you hear Brother David? He, he, he learned me so much. I don't know what yin-yang was all about. But he talked about those people with neckties that had yin-yang on it. And you see all the circles and the white and the black? <laughs> and I went home to get this. It doesn't match my brown pants, but that don't make no difference. <laughs> and this is the last time I'm ever going to wear it because I never did like it. <laughs> and it's got a great big hole in it. <laughs> so if you want it, you can have it. <laughs> But I had to show you my yin-yang. And then you can tell me later what you were talking about. <laughs> so that's point number one. I got to hurry. 
when, when we talked about coming, the question came up about motels and accommodations or private homes. Point number two. And so the blessed power family uh, said, well, if you can put up with giggling girls, you can stay at our house. And that's why I had the word down there, giggling girls. <laughs> and I will tell you, that is exactly what I need now. Because I'm tired of being alone after 55 years being married. And having her gone, and you folks here that have lost your loved one recently, know that it isn't easy. I have cried. I've been lonesome. And the last thing I wanted to do was to go down to the motel. And I will always thank you for letting me be in your home. Number three says ups and downs with Judah. <laughs> this is why I think that I could be a youth minister. We went over for dinner at Brother Dave's house and Judah came running down the steps and he was over the sofa and under the sofa and around the chair and he did more contortions and I wondered what was wrong with that kid. <laughs> and then he come over to me and he sit down. You know, first thing I didn't do was look at him. I thought he was showing off. <laughs> so I didn't look at him. I sit down and I wouldn't watch him at all. And all of a sudden he came over and sit down. And he looked up and he says, what's your name? <laughs> I said, Brother Paul. And I appreciate that. I don't know whether Judah's here or not. But Judah, you made my day. You made my day. I, I mean, uh, I, I love these little ones. If you've watched me since I've been here, I've uh, held the doll baby and I've pushed the cart. And uh, a little girl back there a while ago, I don't know whether she's here or not, she was a-hugging her grandmother. You here, are you? She was a-hugging her grandmother, and I said, would you give me a little bit of that? She reached over and put her arms around me. I says, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lou, oh, Lou. She's got a great big name, and I can't pronounce it, so all I did was put down Lou. I watched Lou. And I watched her walk up here with a pitcher of water and some glass, glasses, you know, for the speakers. And I thought of Jesus. I thought of Jesus, said, I will give you water and you'll never thirst. I watched Lou come this way and that way and this way. And then I asked somebody about Lou and she said, well, and they told me, well, there's Lou and there's Lee. And I saw her today and I said, hello, Lee, Lou, how's Lee or did I have it backwards? She said, how'd you know all that? And I said, I love you. I want to know all about you that I can. Are you here, Lou? Hey, all right. Thank you, honey. You made my day. Thank you. We're family. Thank you for being a part of the family I never had. And then there was Sophia, she's not here today, and her mother and little Daniel. Daniel was another wild one. Boy, he was around this place. I thought for a while he was a little girl. <laughs> and I said something, she says, he's a little boy. And I said, well, if you say he, I guess that qualifies as a boy. <laughs> but uh, she was standing there talking uh, to Sister McCulfer, and boy, her hands were going 100 miles an hour. And uh, when she got done talking, I, she went in the other room and I said to her, I said, may I hold your hand for a minute? And she said, yes. And so she extended her hands and I held it. I said, now will you tell me what your name is and I'll tell you what my name is. And I said, I want to see if you can talk without moving your hands. <laughs> you know, I had to go to college at Ball State, my graduate work, to learn how to do body language. It was a whole course <laughs> in graduate school. And she was doing it all back there in a few minutes. She said, I find it pretty hard to talk without that beautiful lady, wasn't she? And her mother. And the first thing I thought of was Timothy's mother and grandmother. And don't you think that gives Daniel a little chance? Daniel was a little wild one too. And then all of a sudden, he came over and I set him on my lap. 
And I said, will you sing for me? And then he finally sang me a song. I said, now I get a chance to sing to you too. So he listened. So that's my Sophia. And then there's Bill. <laughs> Bill Dinwiddie. You know, he... <laughs> There, there's only one Bill Dinwiddie. Are you here, Bill? God bless you, brother. <laughs> Bill told me that he had a whole set of Wolfgang Puck. Now, don't that excite you? <laughs> How many does that excite? <laughs> now, of course, I got Dish television. And I watch channel 110 all the time. That's the cooking channel. And I know who Wolfgang Puck is. And listen, I'm going to tell you something, brother. Now you listen to me careful, okay? Let's go down to the next one now. It says Rachel. Now in Rachel's room where I was laying last night, she has a great big beautiful book called Cooking Basics. Are you there, Rachel? All right. <laughs> And I read that thing, and Leanne, my daughter-in-law, will tell you, there's nothing more beautiful in the world besides the Bible than a cookbook. I love to get a cookbook in my hand. And so if you're going to use Wolfgang and use it right, you might go over and get together and see if you do it right. On page 133, go home and check me out, it says five essential ways, was the word essential? No, excellent. There it is. Five, on page 133, five excellent ways to fix eggs. I've been fixing eggs for the best part of 70 years and didn't know that I was doing it wrong. <laughs> I don't know what to do because in this it says you get the little custard cup out and you break the egg and you put it in there before you put it in the pan. And I'm not sure I have a custard cup. <laughs> So if anybody's got an extra custard cup, or I might have to go down to Walmart or Goodwill to get a custard cup, because I want to do it like Betty Crocker says to do it. <laughs> oh, what we learn. And then I tell you, these boys, we got some of the most beautiful boys that come to this meeting. They look at me and they say, well, who are you? And out comes the hand of Jonathan. Then the other one comes in, and do I know you? And out comes the hand of Benjamin. And then I'll walk, along comes uh, Micah. And then comes out all the rest. Who, who'd I have dinner with? Was that Israel? Is that your name? Isaac? Oh, I started with the right letter. Do you know Isaac has real good manners? He sit right next to me and had dinner, and... Every time he wanted that cheese, he says, Would you please pass the cheese? Hey, I appreciate that. I, I, I like good manners. And there's not very much left today. But these young people, I, I believe they're a part of the family that I never had. I'm not talking about Jonathan now, but I'm talking about at home when I was a little boy. Rachel, in her room, I looked at everything in the room. I didn't open the drawers. Or, I didn't open anything. <laughs> but there in the middle of one side of the wall, it says, I am not ashamed. God bless you. If we could have young people, young men, young women, moms and dads that can stand before God and say, I am not ashamed. There was a lot of things in her room, and that might have been the smallest thing she had, but that impressed my heart. I was just in that room, I was breathing goodness and holiness all the time. And I would not have got it at Holiday Express. It used to be, and I think I got that written down there someplace, Holiday Express. I've got to follow my outline here. <laughs> Uh, it's there someplace. I used to like those commercials where the guy was a surgeon, you know, or he was a biochemist, or he was an airplane pilot. And uh, uh, how long have you been an airplane pilot? I'm not. Last night I slept at Holiday Express. And you, got all, you remember all those, Jason? Have you ever seen those things? I was in, but I, you know, I don't care about Holiday Express and staying there and, 
and tell them how good I slept. I can tell them now that I've been at Dan and Nelda's and I've been breathing in all that atmosphere. And that's a lot better than Holiday Express. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now, what did I say next? Uh, oh, yeah, I like this. I heard this word for the first time, really, when it had some meaning. I heard this from Given Blakely down there, number eight, groaning. I heard him one day say, we should have a groaner's club. You remember that? You said something like that. We ought to have a groaner's club. And then David got up here and he gave his speech and he was a groaner all the time. And then we, got to, then we got to Ed, and Ed was groaning. And you remember, even somebody as great as Al was up here, and he says, I'm struggling, you know. I'm a groaning. And you know, I do a lot of groaning. Now go back to Acts, the eighth chapter. I can't be preachy because this is testimony, you know. So I, I can't have a sermon. But over in the eighth chapter, it, it talks. What does it say over there, Jonathan? You want to quote it for me? But Romans 8. 26, and, and uh, there's been so many times when I wasn't real sure I knew what the will of God was. And I wasn't really sure that I knew how to pray. And then I found out that when I don't know, all I have to do is pray, and the Holy Spirit is the best interpreter in the world. Those groanings, He understands them, He takes them right to the Father. Oh, that's the greatest feeling in the world to know that I can groan all I want to and God understands. Amen. Yes. Okay, it says, I am what? I don't know what that says. <laughs> I am, which cannot be uttered. I am a something. I don't know what I, oh, gro yeah, I'm a groaner. That's it, okay. And then I had number nine down there. I forgot their name. I think it was B-E-R-T-S-C-H. Are you here? John, where are you? There you go. I enjoy these people, and I met them for the first time. They were here once before, and they're from Allen County in, in Fort Wayne. And I told him, boy, that's where I growed up. I went to graduate school at Ball State, and I was there at the prison, and uh, all the bad people were in Allen County. <laughs> it seemed like everybody that I had trouble with in the prison came from Fort Wayne and Allen County. And I had the privilege of training some of the judges there. That's why they don't have good judges. But anyway, uh, I wrote a manual for classification as my thesis for graduate school. And then number 10 says the picture frame. <laughs> and it says my best. That's the most expensive little picture frame I had at home. And you know what I did? I put something in it and I gave it to Nelda. <laughs> and I know she thinks, well, isn't that pretty? But the secret of it is... And Jonathan and Leanne can tell you, I've got rid of everything. I got tired of dusting. <laughs> and so I just got a big stack of everything. And when I came here, that picture frame was on top. And it was real pretty, so I like to do calligraphy. So I took my black paper and my gold pen, and I wrote a little message saying, thank you for letting me come into your home. And uh, I gave it to her. Now, every time that Jane or every time Rachel or Danny dusts that thing, they're going to have to work. I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> So I was glad to get rid of the picture frame. You're the family that I never had. <laughs> I love you. Uh, that's the best. Okay, no class. Oh, yeah. Oh, Rachel, I don't know how you do it. You might be able to tell me. I didn't have a class in college to tell me how to make a bed up against the wall. That's hard. I I'm laying in this bed, and it's, I think it's a queen-size bed. I don't know. But I can't even reach that far. And I don't, I don't know, I always make my beds as soon as I put my feet on the floor, but I didn't make that one very good, so you're going to have to forgive me. I'm going to have to learn how to make a bed up against the wall like that. that that's a tough one. If I stayed there, I'd have it out in the middle of the room in a hurry. <laughs> uh, Brother Bill. Oh, yeah. What's Bill's last name? Parsons? What is it? Tell me. Parson? I like him with his apron. I like him with his apron. You know what I learned from him? I have thought I was always a good preacher. Never been a great preacher. Now, Jonathan's a great preacher. But I was always a good preacher. But there's a good preacher, and then there's a great preacher, and then there's the greatest. And that's the best up there of all of them. And when I saw Brother Bill and had that apron on, I says, 
He that would be greatest among you, let him be a servant of all. And I tell you, he did something for me. And it is wonderful. I think that if we can only have that spirit of love, compassion, humility, and willing to serve as our Lord did, then we're right up at the top. We're the greatest. I'm almost done now. Bill, all oh right. Cup of water. <laughs> I remember one of the speakers, Sarah, said, every time you do something, people are going to look and see your Savior. That was a good statement. I don't know who made it, but boy, I wrote that down real quick. I mean, when I do something, I want them to look at me and glorify my Father in heaven. You know, just, I'm the interpreter. You know, it's not me that lives, but Christ living in me. And she says, do you want to uh, drink of water, Sister Nelda? And she did, wasn't you that brought me a cup of water last night? And she didn't bring me a glass of water. She didn't bring me ice cubes. She didn't offer me tea or anything else. But she brought me a cup of water. And all of a sudden, my mind thought of the 23rd Psalm in the 5th verse. My cup runneth over. That's the first thing I thought of. My cup runneth over. And I tell you, you're the family I, I never had when I was a little boy. And uh, my cup runneth over for every one of you. I'm almost done. I'm a half cupper. Jonathan and Leanne will tell you. If I'm at your house and you want to give me a cup of coffee, I always say, give me a half a cup. Give me a half a cup. I don't like the whole cup. Uh, okay, that's it. I'm going to put this silly thing away. <laughs> but thank you for being my wonderful family. Oh, yeah, there's Holiday Express on the side. I knew I put it there someplace. And I'm going to tell everybody I was in Ann and Nelda's home there, in, and I enjoyed that. Now let me get serious for about five or ten minutes. And no preaching, just tell you about uh, Ernie. And nobody ever hears that. I don't know whether my son has ever heard it or Leanne or anybody else. But in the streets of Indianapolis in 1929, July the 23rd, I don't want you to send me a birthday card. You can say happy birthday to me today when you leave, and then you won't have to worry about anything else. Just a couple of more days. Uh, on July the 23rd, 1929, I was born in Indianapolis, third child of eight. And those eight children now are all gone their way. Two of them are dead. One is an atheist. One is on the street, a wild person. I had to bail him out of jail one time. Two of my three sisters are unbelievers of the rank order. My brother in California is an eclectic unbeliever. Everybody's right. Oh, everybody's good. All the, every religion, you know, where he's a universalist or whatever. I have one sister, bless her heart, Rita, that keeps me sane. She's as close to being a Christian companion as I ever had. My daddy was always a madman. Today we call it child abuse, but I don't remember any time during the first 12 years of my life when I couldn't count the whelps on my arms. My daddy had a big belt, and he loved to use that belt. And I found out that daddy likes to use the belt because he likes to see the children cry. So I learned not to cry. The other seven kids got the whipping and not me. So, uh... That wasn't a very nice way to grow up. But I want to tell you this, why I'm here today is that God from the moment I was born had his hand on me. He did. I didn't know that, but I know it now. And out of the eight children in our family, grandmother lived with us, and grandmother had a little uh, tobacco sack that she kept inside of her slip there and she had her few pennies in there and one person and only one person ever got her pennies. You know who that was? Ernie. Yeah. They never knew who I was except Ernie. I was Paul. Nobody ever knew that. And then I, I was born in Indianapolis on the 1800 block on Shelby Street and then there was the drug store and then the barber shop, and then the meat market, and the shoe shop, and then my house. And uh, Mr. Michaels at the drug store knew that Ernie was going to come in there and steal everything that wasn't tied down. He knew that. But Mr. Michael never did anything except get me by the back of the hair or the shirt and toss me out. 
When I came back the next day, he never told me not to come in. He knew what I was going to do. <laughs> and then I'd go next door uh, to the barber shop. I'd go past it, not every day. But nobody cared whether I lived or died. Mother didn't care. Dad didn't care. And my nose would run and my hair would get long. And the barber would pull me in there and cut my hair and take that towel and blow my nose. And then I'd go to the next shop, which was the butcher shop. And Johnny there at the butcher shop always had that great big roll of meat paper, you know, that they used to have. And he'd save the best bones. They used to have a great big can that threw all the bones in it. You can't even find. I went to the store asking for bones. They don't even sell them anymore. And, but Johnny always saved me the best bones. Now, I was just one of a million kids in Indianapolis, Indiana. But store after store after store, God had his hand on me, and those men loved me and treated me kind. Until I was five or six years old, mother and dad didn't know where I was most of the time. But on the other street, there was Mr. and Mrs. Ron, and they would take and help me get a bath and give me something to eat. Mother and daddy couldn't care less. Couldn't care less. When I got to school in the first grade, I was the best speller and I was the best writer in the class. And every year I was in grade school, I was first in writing and spelling. I was a good student, but I was a bad boy. They said Sergeant Magenheimer of the Indianapolis Police died because I worried him to death. <laughs> he was there almost every week to take me down to the police station to teach me the rules. And I learned those rules. And there wasn't anybody in that school that I didn't feel like socking. My first grade teacher, my second grade teacher, and my third grade teacher, Mrs. Nackenharst and Mrs. Tattersall and Mrs. Ball. <laughs> I don't know whether I put them in an a early grave or not, but in the fourth grade, Mrs. Goulet just spent most of her time in the clothes closet. <laughs> and she would whack and whack and whack and whack. I don't know if that did any good. <laughs> But all this time, God had his hand on me. And finally, I made it. I finally made it to 16 years of age. Whew, I did. I finally, in 1945, I turned 16 years of age. And I spent about half of a first semester of school. And then I ran away and joined the military. And if any 16-year-old of mine today did that, I'd break their neck. <laughs> Are you listening, Barrick? <laughs> all right. But I ran away and I joined the military service. And there I fell uh, into those who were uh, prostitutes and pigs and all that other stuff in the 15th chapter of Luke that my son was talking about. And it wasn't a very good life of a 16-year-old boy with a lot of GIs during the, the war time. And it was rather tough. I ran away from school. Are you listening, young people? I ran away from school. I hated school. And so when I went to basic training and got out, they sent me to Scott Field, Illinois, and put me in school. High-speed radio operator. Morse code. They sent me overseas uh, to Tokyo, and they put me in school. <laughs> uh, airplane mechanic. MOS 747. And I was in school doing all that. Went on over to Korea. They put me in school again. I mean, I ran away from school, and all the Army could do was put me back in school. And I spent three years in school. Now I got the GI Bill, and I go back, and then I go to Lincoln, and uh, I begin the ministry. There's a little story attached to that. I was a rotten little kid. My dad was a devilish person. Mom and dad didn't care whether I lived or not. God always had his hand on me. And one day when I was, uh, uh, I don't even know whether I should say you because you copy and tape this, but I, I won't say that. But something happened and they threw me in the brig and the, the uh, chaplain says, do you want to get out? And I said, oh yeah, I want to get out. 
And that's, what, that's not really what he was talking about. He was talking about getting out of trouble and being a Christian and so forth. He says, can you type? Well, that, now remember, I told you when I went to the army, the first thing they did was throw me in school to learn how to do Morse code. And I did typewriter, 35 words a minute Morse code. And so he says, I'm looking for a chaplain's assistant. So I wrote to my mother every week. And I said, I got me a new job. I'm in the chaplain's office. I don't know whether that was the right or the wrong thing to say or not. By the time I got home, everybody in Indianapolis knew her son was going to be a preacher. <laughs> and we moved right across the street from the Fountain Square Church in Indianapolis. Fountain Square Christian Church, Warren Mathis was the minister. And first moment I was in the house, he took me across the street and says, here's my son. And uh, the man who led me to Christ over in Korea, uh, he wanted me to go to the Baptist College and become a, a Baptist preacher and I sent my $25 up there to be a Baptist preacher and uh, if you're Baptist here I'm not saying anything unkindly I'm just telling you the story uh, want to be a Baptist preacher and uh, so then when I went mar met uh, I'm trying to say things too fast now I better slow down a little bit but uh, Warren Mathis says well did you ever think of being non-denominational I never heard that word before I didn't know that $1 bill, $5 bill, $10 bill. It's about all I knew about denomination. But it didn't mean anything to me at all, de denomination. I ne never heard the word. I mean, after all, 16-year-old kid, what does he learn when you never go to church? And he says, well, he says, I got this friend, Harold Ford. Harold Ford doesn't have any children. He'd, ha he'd like to have a son just like you. So I said, okay. So he picked up the phone and he called Harold Ford over at Lincoln and said, Harold, got a young man here. He says, uh, would you take care of him? And I said, yes, I'll take care of him. Now listen, God's always had his hand on me. When I went to Lincoln, Harold Ford took care of me. Anybody know Harold Ford? Harold Ford wrote one of the greatest books on the Restoration plea. God's always had his hand on me. 1952, when I was at Covington, Indiana, I was in class with Harold Ford and all of us loved his book and we said, Harold, why don't you print that? He says, it cost a little bit of money. I said, that's no problem. So I went back and my elders were rich farmers and I said, would you print Harold's book? <laughs> and they said, well, yeah, we'll print Harold's book. How much you need? And you'll find in the cover of that little book, Restoration Plea, thanks to the men of Covington, Indiana for publishing this book. So I've always been at the right time, at the right place, and God has used me mightily in his kingdom. And I'm so thankful. I never had a family. You're the family that I never had. And maybe uh, five years from now, when I give the second testimony, I'll give <laughs> the, the second installment of this because uh, uh, time is limited. Father in heaven, it's a joy to be with every one of these children, boys and girls, young ones and teenagers, their moms and dads and grandmothers. And it's great to be a part of the family of God. This is my testimony today. The family that I never had when I was a little boy. It's like Brother Dave said, God is so good. God is so great. And I want to praise him every day of my life until he comes. I hope that I can remain steadfast and sure on that solid rock. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for the privilege.